Panel of Questions, questions will have the Honorable Member from Thornhill. After nine years of this Liberal NDP government and their soft on crime policies, Canada's criminal justice system is broken and Canadians feel unsafe in their neighbourhoods. Here's where we're at today. The biggest gold heist in Canadian history, $20 million gone, several suspects uh, involved with gangs and gun running, and they're already out on bail 24 hours later. Why does this government think the gangsters who steal millions of dollars deserve to be released back into the community? That's right. Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada. I thank the member opposite for that important question. I point out to her and to other members of this chamber that we passed significant bail reform legislation in this chamber with the cooperation of premiers around the country and law enforcement officials around the country. What I would also point out to the member opposite is that I share her concern for organized criminality. In fact, I share it so much so that the Budget Implementation Act contains measures that will address money laundering and address financing through criminality. I desperately I certainly hope that that member and all of her colleagues will be supporting that aspect of our legislation and helping us to tackle organized crime and money laundering. Before I continue with question period for the Honourable Member for Thornhill, who will want to ask her question, I'm going to ask uh, the member from Grand River Miramichi as well as the member from, uh, uh, from Dufferin Caledon, please, uh, to wait your turn uh, to before uh, taking the floor. The Honourable Member from Thornhill. Speaker, it didn't work because Liberals do think that these criminals should be released back into the community because they passed the very bills that made it possible. And they are the reason why gun runners and gangsters who steal millions Millions of dollars in gold get turned back loose into the streets. Did the Prime Minister get a little golden nugget from these criminals to pass his catch and release Bill C-75? When will they finally reverse these policies, protect our communities, and keep criminals in jail where they belong? Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Justice and Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, our resolve to ensure communities are safe is strong. What we did in the past 18 months is we've enacted legislation that addresses the acute causes of crime. What we've done in the past 18 months is ensure that the bail reform system deals with violent, serious offenders, and we had the support of law enforcement right around this country. The other thing that law enforcement has been talking to me and my colleague, the Minister of Public Safety, about is the acute need to address organized criminality in this country. Previous times legislation has been in this chamber, they have voted against such legislative initiatives. They have one more opportunity, but they've already announced they won't be supporting us getting tough with money laundering and organized criminality. The Honourable Member from Thornhill. Speaker, they're out on bail less than 24 hours later. The Liberal incompetence touches so much more than the criminal justice system. You might need a nugget of gold to buy gas in Ontario today. After nine years of this Prime Minister, his carbon tax prices have hiked the cost of gas by 14 cents a litre today. If, you refuse to call, if he refuses to call a carbon tax election, will the Prime Minister put a pause on his punishing hikes over the summer so that Canadians can take a little road trip? Or will he do everyone in this country a favor and take a permanent road trip so the Canadians can afford to live. Yeah. The Honourable Minister for Public Services and Procurement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Eight out of ten, eight out of ten families receive more in the carbon rebate than they pay on the carbon price. The reason is that all the proceeds from the carbon price are sent back to Canadians. Wealthier families pay more, pay more, so low-income and middle-class families get more, Mr. Speaker. Eight out of ten families get more from the carbon Eight rebate the than they pay on the carbon price. In addition to that, obviously, that reduces pollution, that reduces the cost of climate change. Here, here. The, the Honourable Member for Bellechasse, Les Etchemins, Lévis. Mr. Speaker, after nine years of this Prime Minister, the cost of living has reached a truly alarming level. Food banks are busier than ever. Criminals have total impunity, and affordable housing is so scarce that Quebecers are forced to live in motels, Mr. Speaker. Canadians who can no longer afford housing or even food, that is the reality today. This Prime Minister is simply not worth the cost. Will he show Canadians a little empathy, or will he continue to make their living conditions worse, Mr. Speaker? The Honourable Minister of Public Services and Procurement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's the number of units of affordable housing created by the Conservative le leader when he was housing minister. During his whole mandate for the whole country, it's difficult to talk about empathy when we think of the Conservative leader who created six affordable housing units. 
one for each six million Canadians during his mandate. There were 170 created in my colleague's writing recently. The Honourable Member for Belchasse Les Etumets Levy. I'll give him a number. Nine. Nine years of this Liberal government means nine years of inflationary policies, nine years of wasting Canadians' money, and nine years of reckless disregard for them. Money everywhere but in Canadians' pockets, criminals everywhere but in jail, and affordable rents everywhere but in Canada. Why so much failure? The answer is as simple as it is glaring. It's because of this Prime Minister who isn't worth the cost. Can he put an end to the budgetary mess and give a little more thought to Canadians who can't even afford housing because of him? The Honourable Minister of Public Services and Procurement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My colleague is talking about affordable housing. Six affordable housing units under the Conservative leader when he was Minister of Housing for his whole mandate, for the whole country. In just her riding, 173. In just her riding, 173 affordable housing units have been created by municipalities with financial help from the Canadian government. As her leader continues to insult Quebec's municipalities, calling them incompetent with six affordable housing units, there are 173 affordable housing units that have been built in her riding. Once again, I invite members to not speak when they have not been recognized by the Speaker. In particular, I am referring to my friend, my dear colleague from Portneuf, Jacques Cartier. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. The Prime Minister's budget is a budget of threats. The Prime Minister is threatening the provinces with cuts to housing money if they don't accept federal conditions. He's also threatening cities with cuts to public transit funding if they don't agree to have their zoning rules dictated by him. Funny, these are exactly the same threats proposed by the Conservative leader. Canadians already had someone bossing them around at the federal level without proposing any real solutions. Since the budget, they have a second. As for Quebecers, we're stuck with a liberal conservative coalition. Do we really need that? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker. Order, please. The Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, the Bloc Québécois tells us that housing is important. It's, that's great. It's in the budget. They say that helping youth is important. That's great because that's also in the budget. Seniors are also important to the Bloc. Well, look, Mr. Speaker, they're also in the budget. But they're going to do like their Conservative colleagues, their great friends, and they're going to vote against it. It's time for the walk to match the talk. <laughs> the Honourable Member for La Prairie. The ultimate threat of this budget is its pandering. The Liberals' priority isn't housing, it's their re-election. The numbers say it all. If their priority was housing, they wouldn't have budgeted 97% of the billion dedicated to accelerating apartment construction just after the election nor would they have budgeted 91% of the new housing infrastructure fund only after the election. If their priority was housing, they'd be delivering the money now, not after the election. If this isn't their way of saying, vote Liberal, or you won't get a penny, what is? The Honourable Minister of Public Services and Procurement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our colleague is quite right. It's not after, it's now that it's happening. 8,000 housing units in Quebec have been built because of the exceptional partnership between the Government of Canada and the Government of Quebec. 8,000 affordable housing units is the highest number of affordable housing units built in the history of Quebec because of the extraordinary collaboration between the Government of Canada and the Government of Quebec. The only problem, Mr. Speaker, is that it, that, uh, that is bad news for the Bloc Québécois. The Honourable Member for Rosemont, La Petite Patrie. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals don't have the courage to take away the big gifts given to big business by the Conservatives. But cutting 5,000 positions in the public service, they don't mind doing that. Fewer public servants means fewer public services. Like the Conservatives, the Liberals are cutting services, but they give billions of dollars to incompetent 
subcontractors, just look at ArriveCan, why not keep public services by getting rid of subcontractors that cost an arm and a leg and don't do the job? The Honorable President of the Treasury Board, Mr. Speaker, we continue to be responsible in the public service, especially with procurement and also with the public sector. The 2024 budget mentions that there will be natural attrition in the public service. We continue to hold consultations with the public service, with unions, because we know that the public service is here for us and we continue to be here for them. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Vancouver, Kingsway. Mr. Speaker, documents reveal that this government doesn't track job creation from the billions in subsidies they give to corporations. Yeah. So while Canadians struggle to pay rent and buy groceries, the Liberals, like the Conservatives before them, are shoveling billions of dollars each year to big business yeah. with no strings attached. Yeah. It's bad enough that the Liberals don't make corporations pay their fair share, but handing them money without accountability is scandalous. Why are the Liberals giving these corporations a free ride at the expense of Canadians? The Honourable Minister for Innovation. Mr. Speaker, I am very glad that just the day after the budget, my colleagues give me the opportunity to talk about the great investments that we've been attracting in this country, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Just look, for example, Mr. Speaker, last year, Canada ranked third in the world and one per capita for attracting foreign investment. Just think about NordVault in Quebec, Mr. Speaker, the largest private investment in the province history. Just talk about Volkswagen, Mr. Speaker, in St. Thomas. This is going to change the whole region. And we're creating job, we're creating prosperity, we're creating opportunities for generation. Think about Windsor, Mr. Speaker, which young this is the investment we've seen from North Star is gonna change. Mr. Speaker, we're gonna fight every day for Canadians. Again, order. I'd like to remind members. And I know some members who have raised in the past that they've been concerned about uh, the level of noise in here and speaking out of turn. Let us all uh, restrain ourselves so we can hear the question and the answer to the question from the member from uh, Foothills. After nine years, Canadian farmers know this Prime Minister is not worth the cost. Over the last several weeks, I've received dozens of letters representing tens of thousands of farm families from right across this country. These are grain farmers, ranchers, mushroom growers, fruit and vegetable growers, provincial premiers, and agriculture ministers. They're unanimous. To ensure the sustainability of food production in Canada, they need the NDP Liberal Carbon Tax Coalition to reverse its 23% hike in the carbon tax and pass 234 in its original form. Will the Prime Minister ensure food and farming are affordable and pass 234 in its original form? The Honourable Minister for Agriculture and Agri-Food. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate my Honourable Colleague's question. Uh, but of course, in the budget, there's been good news, not only for Canadians, but farmers right across the country. For an example, in, uh, enhancing the Livestock Tax Deferral Program, which is a big asset to, to when, when, uh, when ranchers have a downturn with, with, with the climate, and also with the Advanced Payment Program, is putting a, a $250,000. All these things and many more are so important for, to make sure that Farmers and ranchers stay on the cutting edge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Foothills. I, I'm not sure that it's good news when after nine years of this Prime Minister, demand on food banks is at a record high, exactly. and more and more Canadians can't afford to feed their families. In Prince Edward Island, the Caring Cupboard Food Bank is struggling just to keep its doors open as demand is up 70%. Wow. These are the Agriculture Minister's own constituents. And what is his response? Increase the carbon tax by 23%, driving food costs even higher. Shameful. Why will this Prime Minister not ensure that farming and food is more affordable and pass Bill C-234 in its original form? Here, 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 here. The Honourable Minister for Agriculture and Agri-Food. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I'm kind of surprised to get this question from a man, uh, uh, my colleague who was so interested in agriculture. Quite simply, when they were in power, 
They slashed a half a billion dollars from agriculture and agri-food. Right. They slashed $200 million for, from the business risk management program. All of these things are so important when agriculture has a downturn. We have reinstated the funds and will continue to support our farmers and ranchers right across the country. The Honourable Member from Barry Innisfil. People in Ontario went into full panic mode last night, lining up to fill up because gas was going up to $1.80 a litre, the highest it's been in two years. 18 cents in every litre of gas is because of this NDP Liberal Prime Minister's carbon tax. And by the time the costly coalition is done, the carbon tax will quadruple, rising 61 cents a litre. After nine years and an extra $10 to fill up overnight, the Prime Minister is not with the worth the cost. How about cancelling the carbon tax on gas this summer so Canadians can at least enjoy that time-honoured tradition of a road trip? Yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, when the Conservatives blame the cost of living crisis on carbon pricing and proven emissions reduction strategies, they're only serving the greedy corporate interests of billionaire grocery and oil and gas executives. There's no rebate on the provincial gas tax that Danielle Smith jacked up on Albertans on April 1st. There's no rebate on the summer fuel surcharge or excessive oil and gas profits. But the Canada carbon, carbon rebate is four quarterly payments per year as an incentive to use a little less and get a little bit more tax-free cash in your account four times a year. These Conservatives don't have a plan for affordability. They don't have a plan for the environment. They consistently prioritize the corporate interests of their greedy oil and gas masters over the needs of everyday Canadians. Order. The Honourable Member from Barry Innisville. If that member is so confident in the carbon tax, I dare him to convince the Prime Minister to call an election. Yeah. stations across Barrie Innisfil last night. Costco was so busy that cars were lined up in live traffic on Mapleview. The NDP Liberal government plans on quadrupling the carbon tax to 61 cents a litre. The lineups and panic across the country shows that after nine years, Canadians can no longer afford this costly coalition. Why don't they just come and live with reality and axe the carbon tax so Canadians can afford life? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. There was an election on the carbon tax. In fact, there was three of them. We won them all. And last election, they ran on a, pro a promise with Aaron O'Toole. Remember that? Remember his little cover? He cared about the environment for a change. Conservatives all of a sudden cared about climate change. And they were going to use carbon pricing to lower emissions. Well, they lost. But they still all ran on that promise to price carbon. But when this new member of, uh, of Parliament, the leader of the Conservatives, the, uh, the, the Petro puppet of Carlton, <laughs> came in play. We can be pointed, we can be passionate, and we can be uh, many things. But what we must always remain to do is to make sure that we're carrying ourselves and we refer to each other uh, politely. Uh, the Honourable Member, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary knows that. I'm going to ask him just to withdraw that part of his statement, and then he has five seconds to finish his question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. These Conservatives can dish it out, but they ran on carbon pricing, and they've got no integrity for fighting it at this stage. I did ask the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary just to withdraw that part of his statement so that we could stay on the right side of being polite. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, I uh, apologize for causing a little bit of disruption. It seems that the Conservatives are... The Honourable Member did apologize for causing disruption in the House. The Honourable...
Well, I see that a member is, a very respected member is up on her feet as she knows that there is uh, no points of order during question period. However, uh, the, I would suggest that she raises this after question period and we'll deal with it then. The Honourable Member from Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Before this government came into power, road trips used to be a staple vacation for many Canadian families. Gas prices in Ontario skyrocketed overnight, pushing a buck 80. This is the highest price in two years. The Liberal NDP Prime Minister's carbon tax is now at 18 cents a litre of gas, and when he quadruples the carbon tax, it will shoot up even higher. After nine years, Canadians are convinced this Prime Minister is not worth the cost. Mr. Speaker, will the Prime Minister cancel the carbon tax on gas this summer so Canadians can afford a family vacation? Here, here. Here, here. The Honourable Minister for Workforce Development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let's bring some sanity and fact into this conversation. Dan McTeague, who is the president of the advocacy group Canadians for Affordable Energy, said in past years the switch over to summer blend fuel typically results in an increase in fuel of about 6 to 10 cents per litre. In warmer weather, refiners are required to make this change so that the fuel is more stable. There's good news, Mr. Speaker. Prices will come down about five cents by Friday, by September even lower. This has nothing to do with the price on pollution and everything to do with theatrics by the Conservatives. Yeah. <laughs> the, the Honourable Member. The Honourable Member from Hastings, Lennox, and Addington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Completely out of touch. Yeah. There's debt, chaos hardship and stress hitting Canadians and it is the policies of this Liberal NDP government that have directly contributed to the pain they are feeling. The reality is the family budget has shrunk and family vacations are a thing of the past for many. A dollar eighty for gas this morning. Mr. Speaker, will the Prime Minister cancel the carbon tax and take a permanent vacation so Canadians can afford a small summer road trip? <laughs> The Honourable Minister for Employment and Workforce Speaker, Development. We go through this every year. We change from winter blend to summer blend, and we're required to do so so that the fuel stays stable in our vehicles. Mr. Speaker, here's what else Dan McTeague had to say. The most important ingredient in fuel is alkalites, and alkalites are extremely expensive right now. Mr. McTeague said the good news is there will be a five cents a litre drop at the pumps by this Friday. We're fighting climate change. This has nothing to do with it. Pure theatrics from concern Conservatives to scare people while we have the backs of Canadians from coast to coast to coast. The Honourable Member for Drummond. Mr. Speaker, on page 74 of Budget 2024, it's titled Halal Mortgages. This isn't the first time the federal government has considered Sharia compliant mortgages. In 2009, CMHC had commissioned a study on the subject. The reaction of the Muslim Canadian Congress at the time had been clear. I quote its founder, Tarek Fatah, this, halal mortgages, targets vulnerable and marginalized Muslims who are told that if they do business with non-Muslims, they will go to hell. My question is simple, Mr. Speaker. Who exactly is this measure aimed at? The Honourable Minister of National Revenue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is a financial tool that has not been proposed by the government, but that exists. What we've said is that we are going to study this matter to ensure that it is done following the rules. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Drummond. Oof. Mr. Speaker, on Tuesday, the Quebec Lieutenant was lecturing us. Can Canada is a secular country. We care about secul secularism too. We're Quebecers. They just want to pick a fight. You know the drill, Mr. Speaker. So if the Liberals are so in favour of secularism, can they tell us why they want to move the election date due to a religious holiday and why they want to introduce elements of Sharia into the mortgage rules of this supposedly secular country? Oh. The Honourable Minister of National Revenue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, this is a financial tool that is absolutely not put forward by our government. We are looking at the product. We want to know if it is fair, if it follows the rules. We are just going to study this matter. There's no intention from our government 
to support. We just want to make sure it's fair. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Drummond. Then why is it in the budget, Mr. Speaker? I don't understand. Anyways, Mr. Speaker, we are witnessing a clash of values. While the Minister of Justice intends to use Quebecers' money to challenge Quebec's law on the secular nature of the state, the Liberals are thinking of incorporating more religions into Canadian law. I will once again quote Tarek Fatah, founder of the Muslim Canadian Congress on Halal Mortgages. We see this as the financial front of the Islamist movement. These are serious words. Will the government admit that it is not defending secularism, but rather bringing more and more religion into the affairs of the state? <laughs> the Honourable Minister of National Revenue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, we are talking about financial tools that are available on the market. This is in no way a product proposed by our government. We want to ensure that this financial product that is on the market is not breaking the rules. Thank you. Member from Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. After nine years of this NDP Liberal Prime Minister, he's not worth the cost or the corruption of his $60 million arrive scam. The Prime Minister's favourite scamster told the House yesterday that his home had been raided by the RCMP for his role in this latest scandal. But he also told the House that the NDP Liberal government han hasn't asked for a penny back of the ill-gotten gains. Now, the House has ordered it. Why hasn't this Prime Minister enforced it? When will Canadians get their money back? Hey. The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, as my honourable friend knows, there are internal audits being conducted by the CBSA. The RCMP are looking into this matter. The Auditor General had done a report and we've accepted the recommendations and my colleague from Public Services and Procurement has changed many of the rules around these types of contracts. Mr. Speaker, we've also said from the beginning, anybody who abused taxpayers' money will face the consequences. And of course, the government will always seek to recover taxpayers' money that was spent inappropriately. The Honourable Member for Leeds Grenville, Thousand Island and Rideau Lakes. Well, I'm pleased to hear from the latest candidate to be the next leader of the Liberal Party that he's interested in getting Canadians their money back because the current Prime Minister has so far refused. And that's what we heard from GC Strategies frontman yesterday after telling us that for playing his role in the Prime Minister's latest scandal, his house has been raided, but the Prime Minister has still failed to get Canadians their money back. The House has ordered it, and we just want to know when the Prime Minister and the next person auditioning for his job are going to enforce it. When do Canadians get the cash back? Yeah. The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Speaker, again, my honourable friend knows that there are a series of internal audits being conducted with respect to this matter. He referred to the RCMP that are also seized with many of these issues. They took a certain action yesterday, which we heard about in this House as well, Mr. Speaker. I think the honourable member should have some confidence that those who have abused taxpayers' money will face the consequences. And if taxpayers' money has been misplaced or mishandled, of course the government will seek to recover those funds. The honourable member for Mégantic Lérable. The Prime Minister and his allies in the bloc should be ashamed of having voted to grant millions more for Arrive Can, a decision that made the owners of GC Strategies multimillionaires. Kristen Firth, co-founder of GC Strategies, said yesterday that the Prime Minister has made no move to recover the money wasted on his Arrive Can app. Arrive Can cost $60 million. Yesterday, the Prime Minister ordered his troops not to ask questions and not to seek reimbursement from GC Strategies. The clock is ticking. When will the Prime Minister give Canadians back their money wasted on Arrive Can? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, as I said to our colleague in the past, of course, he knows very well that there are investigations underway, including by the RCMP. There are internal verifications underway. My colleague, the Minister of Public Services and Procurement, has changed some rules following the Auditor General's report. And we've always said that anyone who has abused taxpayer money will have to face consequences. And of course, the government 
will undertake the necessary processes to recover that money. The Honourable Member from Hamilton Centre. Mr. Speaker, Ontarians woke up this morning to find out that they got mugged by corporate oil and gas greed today. Gas prices are up 14 cents to $1.80 at the pumps. Now, this Liberal government almost found the courage to tax the profits of the oil and gas corporations, but buckled when after their lobbyists told them not to. So, both Liberals and Conservatives, we know, will always protect the record profits of the oil and gas corporations. So when will this Liberal government finally find the spine to say no to the lobbyists and actually stand up for hard-working Canadians? The Honourable Minister for Innovation. Mr. Speaker, usually I say we will take no lessons from the Conservative, but this time I'll say that from the NDP. Mr. Speaker, Canadians watching at home know that we have been fighting for them every single day, Mr. Speaker. Every member on this side of the House wakes up in the morning to work for Canadians to improve their lives, to make sure that we stabilize prices, Mr. Speaker. We introduced the largest reform on competition in this country, Mr. Speaker, something that we should all be proud of because that is the most consequential thing to help Canadians not only for this generation but for generations to come. The, the law. The Honourable Member from Lady Smith, the Nanaimo Lady Smith. Mr. Speaker, as wildfires okay. devastate Canadian communities, the need for sustainable, clean energy is greater than ever. Yet, the Liberals continue to side with oil and gas and delay on placing a strong emissions cap on big polluters. The Conservatives, on the other hand, are happy to sit back and let the planet burn. New Democrats know that immediate action is needed to tackle the climate crisis. Why do the Liberals keep caving to big oil and refuse to enforce an emissions cap to save our kids' future? Here, here. The Honourable Minister for Employment and Workforce Development. Mr. Speaker, I would invite the New Democrat caucus and their leader to find the courage of their own convictions and come back to supporting us on a price on pollution. We are staying in the lane on fighting carbon, on fighting pricing on pollution each and every day. We're going to make sure that we have a planet that will be here for our kids and our grandkids. We will have a price on pollution. Eight out of ten Canadians will get more money back. That's what we've set to do. We've run three elections on it. We're going to keep doing that, Mr. Speaker. We're going to defend Canadians. We're going to defend the planet. We're going to do it in a way that makes Canadians better off. The Honourable Member from Guelph. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As the Chair of the Science and Research Committee and the Member for Guelph, I'm really excited about the investments in science in the recent budget. Researchers and scientists across Canada have a vital role in developing innovation and knowledge. Can the Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry highlight the important investments our government is making in our science and research space that will support students and generations of researchers to come? Tough question. Tough question. The Honourable Minister for Innovation. I would like to first thank my colleague for his leadership on research and science. Mr. Speaker, our budget has shown that we have vision and ambition for science and research right in this country, Mr. Speaker, because on this side of the hall, we know that the science of today is the economy of tomorrow. We have announced historic investment in infrastructure because we want to make sure that we would have state-of-the-art facilities for our researchers in this country. But more importantly, Mr. Speaker, we have made an historic investment in grants to support our researcher, our young students, and the next generation, Mr. Speaker. With our investment, we know that science in this country will continue to make sure that we have prosperity for generations to come. Good job. The Honourable Member from Calgary, Midnapore. Yesterday, Christian Firth of GC Strategies confirmed his home was raided by the RCMP. GC Strategies proposed a contract to the Deputy Prime Minister's former Chief of Staff and current Liberal Campaign Director, Jeremy Broadhurst. Wow. This contract led to Tuesday's raid on Christian Firth's home. So can the Deputy Prime Minister confirm her communication on a contract proposal that led to an RCMP raid yesterday? Yeah. The Honourable Minister for Public, Servi sorry, Public Services and Procurement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As our colleague from Public Safety has made clear repeatedly yep. in the last few minutes, this is a matter under investigation, both internally 
and by the RCMP. It would be totally inappropriate for politicians anywhere in this House to try to pretend that it would be better than those partners and the RCMP to do that type of work. The Honourable Member from Calgary, Midnapur. Mr. Speaker, I'll tell you what's inappropriate. The Arrive Can app is under RCMP investigation, but we now know that there are two RCMP investigations connected to GC strategies. The raid on Christian Firth's house two days ago raises more concerns about both contracts, one that we now know has a connection to the Deputy Prime Minister's office. Wow. After nine years, GC wow. strategies has been paid more than a wow. hundred million dollars by the Liberal government. So will the Deputy Prime Minister cooperate with the RCMP investigation? Yeah. Yeah. The Honourable Minister for Public Works, Public Services and Procurement. Merci, Monsieur le Président. J'ai déjà... Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I've already answered the question in English, so I'll do so in French as well. Indeed, we know that internal inquiries are taking place on this matter, and in the AG report, we now know that significant measures were brought into place and have been brought into place after the report. It would also be completely inappropriate for politicians in this House to think that they can do better than these organizations, especially the RCMP. A member from Sherwood Park, Park Fort Saskatchewan. The Prime Minister's arrive scam led to unprecedented testimony before this House of Commons, which the Liberal House leader tried to shut down. And no wonder, this scam, which the NDP and Liberals voted for, cost taxpayers at least $60 million. Wow. Parliament ordered the government to pay the money back, but Liberals have not even asked for it to be returned. Now the RCMP have come knocking. After nine years, this Prime Minister is not worth the cost, the corruption, or the crime. Will the Prime Minister finally follow the direction of Parliament and get back the arrive Life scam cash. The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, my honourable friend knows that this government always works collaboratively with Absolutely. Parliament. We've done so in many cases. In fact, parliamentary committees have also looked into this matter, and government officials have been, of course, available to answer all their questions and provide documents. As my colleague, the Minister of Public Services and Procurement, made clear, Mr. Speaker, there are internal audits taking place. Mm. The RCMP are also seized. With this issue, we think it would be appropriate to allow these investigations to conclude. And I can assure you, Mr. Speaker, the government will always take steps to recuperate taxpayers' money that was inappropriately expended and hold those accountable that have abused taxpayers' money. Right up. The Honourable Member from Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. Mr. Speaker, they haven't cooperated because this House voted to ask for the money to be paid back. And Christian Firth testified that this government has not taken any steps to seek the return of the money. After nine years, it's clear that this Prime Minister is presiding over a severely incontinent contracting system where money constantly flows to NDP Liberal insiders. Canadians need a government they can depend on to stop the crime and end the corruption. Again, will the Prime Minister follow the direction of this Parliament and ask the arrive scammers to return the money? Return the money! The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, my honourable colleague uh, has just repeated his previous question. Yeah. I'll give him the same answer. This government always takes the use of taxpayers' money extremely seriously. Absolutely. We have said that if taxpayers' money has been misplaced or mishandled, of course the government will ask mm -hmm. that that money be returned and take the steps appropriate to recuperate that money. And in the case of individuals, my colleague may have taken note of the RCMP action yesterday, in the case of individuals who have abused taxpayers' money, of course the RCMP will take the steps necessary to investigate these matters. It's a given. Right. The Honourable Member for Joliette. Mr. Speaker, this Liberal budget doesn't just, doesn't just represent the end of any respect for jurisdiction, it also represents the end of any level of competence in politics. Ottawa is trying to impose its priorities without even thinking about whether it makes sense. For example, building 40-floor apartment towers near schools in neighbourhoods which it knows nothing about, or creating standards for skilled trades without knowing anything about it. Same thing for long-term care. Why not let competent people take care of issues that are in their fields of jurisdiction? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, the Bloc Québécois should show some courage. It should tell us exactly what part of the budget they object to. Investing in housing? 
Do they object to helping to feed kids so they're not hungry at school? Are they against investments to help municipalities in our rural regions? What exactly do they object to? They should have the courage to say so, because right now they don't dare come out and say exactly what they don't like. They're just asking, they're just acting like their best friends right next to them in the House. They don't have the courage to tell us what they don't like. They just want to vote against the budget. The Honorable Member for Joliet. Well, Mr. Speaker, we are against interference in our jurisdiction. If the Liberals want to do pol Quebec politics, then they should run for the Liberal Party of Quebec. Otherwise, they should take care of things at the federal level. There's plenty to do. They should transfer money for housing instead of negotiating until 2025. They should put an end to the two-tier system for seniors. They should refund Quebec for asylum seekers. They should reform EI, as they've been promising since 2015. They should stop the fossil fuel industry from spoiling the fight against climate change. They should simply do their job. When will they? The Honourable Minister of Public Services and Procurement. My colleague is a distinguished economist, Mr. Speaker. He knows that it's important for everyone to work together to take care of Canadians, including Quebecers, who are struggling these days. So, of course, he'll be very happy to see that $6 billion have been invested in Quebec over four years. Quebec is very happy about it. It's enabled 35,000 new childcare spots to be opened up. As an economist, as I am, he knows that that's very good for gender equality, for reducing poverty, and for helping our children develop, all while respecting provincial jurisdiction. The Honourable Member from Edmonton Mill Woods. I know we have all heard the horror stories on how bad auto theft has gotten in this country after nine years of this NDP Liberal government's soft on crime policies. And now we have reports coming out of Toronto that a good Samaritan had pulled over to help somebody in medical distress. And while he was helping them, his car was stolen. That's how broken this country has become that a car is stolen every six minutes and violent carjackings are on the rise. Now, since they're not going to do anything about it, when will they just get out of the way and let a common-sense Conservative government come in and stop the crime? The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, my honourable friend knows that this government takes that very worrisome Absolutely. rise in criminality very seriously. I had a very good conversation last week with my counterpart in Ontario, the Solicitor General. We agreed on a series of measures that we can continue to do together with local police forces, the Ontario Provincial Police that are doing important work in this area. And of course, the RCMP is always a partner with the Canadian Border Services Agency around transnational organized crime. Mr. Speaker, we'll continue to do everything possible in collaboration with our partners to bring this worrisome trend down. Yeah. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg saint charles Mr. Speaker, we learned in the media that a Montreal police officer had to fire on an auto thief who was trying to run him over. These thieves are more and more reckless. They're not afraid of the justice system. That's why our leader has presented a common sense plan in order to increase sentences for auto thieves. Will the Prime Minister listen to this and crack down on auto theft? The Honourable Minister of Justice, there are two things I want to say, Mr. Speaker. First of all, as soon as C-75 came into this House, this very member voted against the bill, which would have increased sentences for auto theft. Now, here in the budget, we have unveiled an increase in sentences for auto theft. But this member and his leader have already said that they are against our budget and against our efforts to reduce auto theft. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute Saint Charles. On the contrary, Mr. Speaker, I think the Minister of Justice has forgotten that because of C5 and C75, with its catch and release system, auto thieves and other criminals in Montreal have nothing to be afraid of. They know that they can operate with impunity. They'll just be set free right away. That's what we see with C-75. Would the Minister of Justice or the PM answer the question, will they increase sentences for auto thieves so that they actually have something to be scared of and so that they finally stop stealing cars in Montreal? The Honourable Minister of Justice and Attorney General, just to be very clear, for constituents of this member, 
when C-75 was in this house, we proposed including sentences from 18 to 24 months for auto theft, and yet this member and all of his colleagues voted against that. And in this budget, we're not just going to change the criminal code, we're also going to change penalties for money laundering. And yet my colleague and all of his conservative colleagues have already said they will vote against it. It's very hard to understand what he's talking about. Let us have Deputy de Sudbury. Mr. Speaker, eliminating violence against indigenous women and girls, two-spirit and gender diverse people is an urgent priority in Canada. Many have been calling for the implementation of a red dress alert to notify the public when an indigenous woman, girl or two-spirit person goes missing. Can the Honourable Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations update the House on how the government is advancing these efforts? The Honourable Minister for Crown Indigenous Relations. Mr. Speaker, the ongoing national crisis must come to an end. No one knows this better than the families of those who have lost their loved ones to this crisis. That is why we're working with Indigenous partners and leveraging Budget 2024 investment of $1.3 million to co-develop a regional red dress alert system. From housing to Indigenous policing, Budget 2024 continues to make progress on the systemic change needed to put this crisis to an end once and for all. I want to thank the member for that important question and for advocacy. We will continue to do this work, important work, with Indigenous partners and colleagues across the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Barry Springwater, Oral Medante. Mr. There. Speaker, after nine years of this NDP Liberal government, this Prime Minister is not worth the cost or the crime. Right. Today we learn that thieves who stole $20 million in the biggest gold heist in Canadian history are out on bail. Right. This is because of the Liberal government's shameful Bill C-75 that allows offenders to be in jail in the morning and back on the streets in the evening. Will the Prime Minister reverse his bail over jail policies in Bill C-75? The Honourable Minister of Justice and Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, the bill that the, the Conservative Party loves to discuss in this context has actually included things such as increased penalties for auto theft, a key criminality issue that is seizing Canadians right now. It's an issue that we need to all address. I find it a little bit disturbing and a little bit hypocri hypocritical, actually, that that member and all of his colleagues actually voted against that bill at the time, which would have helped augment the crimes against uh, people who steal, who steal uh, automobiles. But yet they have another opportunity, but unfortunately, they've already declared that Vis a vis the further efforts we are taking to address automobile theft, they're continuing to vote against. The Honourable Member from Kamloops, Thompson Caribou. After nine years of NDP Liberals, offenders like Bernardo and Magnata are living better than many Canadians True. with cable, canteen, and a beautiful gym. This is at a time when Canadians are having trouble when it comes to heating, eating, and housing. Breaking news, Mr. Speaker, the Correctional Officers Union tells us that crime is thriving, not on the streets, but in jail, with drones dropping drugs and serious weapons. When will this government realize that violent offenders shouldn't have access to these things? Who's running corrections? Yeah. The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, my honourable friend knows very well that the safety of the men and women who work in the correctional service is of paramount importance to the government. I have met with representatives of the union. I talked to the administration at the Correctional Service of Canada often about what steps we can take to give them the technologies and the tools necessary to protect the people who work in our correctional system. And Mr. Speaker, we will always do everything we can to keep these institutions safe for the brave women and men who do this difficult work for Canadians. The Honourable Member from Fort McMurray, Cold Lake. Mr. Speaker, top BC police are sounding alarm bells that drug decriminalization, a dangerous and radical NDP Liberal experiment, has handcuffed their ability to keep our communities safe. Under this dangerous social experiment, drug use is legal in hospitals, playgrounds, parks and beaches. The Deputy Chief of Vancouver Police said due to decriminalization, there is nothing they can do about it. Will the Prime Minister end his dangerous and deadly drug decriminalization experiment. Yes or no. The Honourable Minister for Mental Health and Addictions. 
Mr. Speaker, what the member chooses to ignore or not listen to when law enforcement also says is that they've been crystal clear. Fentanyl is driving the crisis and too many Canadians are dying as a result of it. People are dying alone, Mr. Speaker, and they're only concerned about one thing, misusing the facts. I will be meeting with my counterpart in BC and law enforcement partners to discuss how we can further work together to address diversion. But Mr. Speaker, diversion is illegal. The member knows that. And we expect law enforcement to do their job, as well as the regulatory colleges, and act swiftly to address it. We are working together, Mr. Speaker. Where are they? The Honourable Member from Kitchener, Conestoga. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Small and medium-sized businesses are an integral part of Canada's economy. They employ about 65 per cent of Canada's workers. Recognizing that small businesses deserve additional supports, it's important for us to make doing business more affordable for entrepreneurs. Can the Minister of Small Business tell us about the measures in Budget 2024 that will help entrepreneurs in Kitchener-Conestoga and across Canada? The Honourable Minister for Small Businesses. Mr. Speaker, I thank my honourable colleague for that question. As a former small business entrepreneur myself, I know the importance of affordability for entrepreneurs. So I am glad that through Budget 2024, our government is committed to delivering $2.5 billion to small businesses uh, and to 600,000 small businesses across Canada through the Canada Carbon Rebate. Reports say that small businesses are directly impacted by 60% of them are directly impacted by climate change. And while the official opposition continues to want to cut the Canada carbon rebate, on this side of the House, we're going to continue fighting climate change while putting uh, money back into the pockets of Canadians and small businesses. The Honourable Member from Winnipeg Centre. Mr. Speaker, while the Finance Minister celebrates so-called feminist policies in this year's budget, in rural Manitoba, the Liberals have cut all funding for counselling and legal services for survivors of sexual violence at the Survivors Hope Crisis Centre. Time and again, this Prime Minister shows that he is a fake feminist. Meanwhile, the Conservative leader undermines women's rights at every corner, cozying up to extreme misogynists like Alex Jones. Yeah. Will the Minister do what's right and restore funding for survivors at the Hope Crisis Centre. Here, here. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Speaker, we know there's always more to do, and I really appreciate the member opposite and the work that she does on the Status of Women Committee. She is a true advocate for women, but I will point to the fact that this budget does cover contraceptives for women. Nine million Canadians will be able to make choices on their bodies because of this investment. We've got investments against workplace sexual harassment. We've got investments to have more childcare spaces in this country and more investments to support queer and trans people in this country, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Richmond North Vasca. Mr. Speaker, the government has brought back in a requirement for most Mexicans to have a visa in order to come to Canada. People with valid work permits can come to Canada with just an electronic authorization, but members of their family and their children are not included. They need to get a visitor visa for their children, but that takes much longer. A mother in my riding lost her job because she couldn't come back to Canada without leaving her child in Mexico. It's a lose-lose lose, lose situation for the worker, her family, and for the business. Will the Minister of Immigration do something about the situation promptly? The Honourable Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship. I'd like to ask the member to come see me after this session in order to discuss the situation. Now, we know that people get their visa in Mexico. That's the rule, and if there are any exceptions that need to be discussed, I would encourage him to come see me. Following discussions, following discussions among representatives of all parties in the House, I understand there is an agreement to observe a moment of silence. I now invite I now invite the House to rise and observe a minute of silence in memory of the victims of the tragic event that happened four years ago in Nova Scotia. <laughs> 